Welcome to the Humane Hoax Chicken Webinar, the historic first ever webinar dedicated solely to chickens. This is Mary Britton Klaus and with my sainted partner Albert Klaus at my side, I will talk about rescued chickens, what they want, what they need, and what they don't. We're deeply indebted to the United Poultry Concerns and the other sponsoring organizations for focusing a light on the most invisible land animal on this fragile planet. We all stand on the shoulders of UPC's work. This presentation will describe why, how, and where Chicken Run Rescue has rescued chickens in need and outline some of the essential recommendations if you'd like to try this at home. I preface my remarks with a note that our sanctuary is located in Minnesota, where the brutal climate dictates the shelter needs of the tropical jungle fowl we rescue. They just don't belong here and they suffer terribly for it. Rescue and other geographic locations will have different challenges. If we could move them all to the tropics, we would. But the birds are here, so here we are. Every Chicken Run Rescue email carries this message. Chicken Run Rescue fosters an evolution in critical thought about who is food and who is friend through rescue, rehabilitation, sanctuary, and education. Help all animals by adopting a vegan diet. Help individual chickens by adopting them as companions. The real cost of eggs. Laying hens have been bred to lay incessantly. Chickens in the wild lay fewer than 20 eggs a year and live to 30 years old. Contemporary laying hens lay between 300 and 350 eggs a year and develop reproductive disease, which is the cause of up to 90% of the mortality in egg laying flocks, beginning at the age of two years old. It is a protracted and horrible death. Google laying hens and ovarian cancer and egg yolk peritonitis in laying hens and choose images. For every laying hen, there is a dead or abandoned rooster. Google male chicks. Chickens are tropical jungle fowl and need serious and costly protection in Minnesota's extreme hot and cold climate. I'll start with a brief history of how Chicken Run Rescue started and cover the basics of rescue and care in a home environment. At the end, I'll introduce rescues Mayim and Sophie and their new foster family, vegan activists Mark and Laura. We recently set them up for their first experience in caring for chickens in a suburban home environment. This is not meant to be a comprehensive tutorial, but an inspirational motivation for animal rights activists to truly know and help the birds they advocate for, one bird at a time. In 1980, we loved animals and ate them. We moved from New Mexico to Minnesota and settled in an ethnically diverse neighborhood in North Minneapolis that suited our social and political views that did not yet include animals. It was the most disadvantaged and violent area in Minneapolis. We became deeply involved in dog and cat rescue. The abject cruelty to dogs, cats, and humans, and lack of law enforcement that we witnessed was what got us politically motivated and led to our exposure to animal rights philosophy, food animal health, and ultimately to vegetarianism, then veganism by 1990. This is Arnold. He was the first chicken we ever held. We are removing the duct tape that held razors to his legs for fighting. He was among seven roosters taken in a 2001 cockfighting bust, slated for death at Minneapolis Animal Control Facility. We stepped up to help them and this marked the beginning of Chicken Run Rescue. Bert and I started by finding homes for those roosters. The next time a chicken was picked up as a stray, Animal Control called us, and our door has been open to every stray or abandoned chicken in the city since. Henrietta was our first hen, and the first to eat the hostas in the garden. As animal rights activists who lived in the city, we never imagined we could actually help real victims of food abuse right in our community, much less teach others about them. Chickens are the most abused, exploited, and devalued land animals on the planet, both in unimaginable numbers and degrees of atrocity. The neighborhood kids got to know the birds and why we don't eat them. Many returned years later to visit. Since 2001, Chicken Run Rescue has been working with Minneapolis 
and St. Paul Animal Control and Humane Societies, providing a home for abandoned chickens. We started in our inner city house in Minneapolis on one-tenth of an acre. Every square inch of the garden and house was pressed into service. Our humble beginnings are documented in a 2010 Facebook album, Aerial Tour of Chicken Run Rescue. Over the next couple of years, the birds taught us what they wanted, needed, and didn't. And we refined our adaptations of a traditional residence into a home we shared with the birds. Our Facebook album, 2014 Tour of Chicken Run Rescue, shows many of the ways we organized and improved. In 2016, we relocated to our present 12-acre location, about 30 miles away from the city. Mavis Davis was the first of our rescues to set foot on the new property right after the closing. This house and property was chosen specifically for its adaptability to the needs of the birds and their humans to live on all under the same roof. Farms do not exist in nature. The word legitimizes the prejudice that farm animals are meant to be food and are somehow different from other animals. That, as Karen Davis describes them, born to be harmed. The way farm animals are treated lowers the bar for every other human, for every other harm that humans visit on all animals. Farm carries with it the mixed message that there are good farms and bad farms, when in fact the whole concept of a farm is the problem. You can see more pictures of how we have strived to blend the birds' needs and our beliefs in this album on our website, Home Not Farm, Pictorial Tour of Chicken Run Rescue. At the end of this presentation, there is a list of supplies and equipment resources used at CRR. When we started CRR, the intent was to adopt out rescues, but finding homes that met our standards became next to impossible. Customary care for chickens is based on using them for a purpose. To find homes where they would be loved and respected, we had to reach and teach other vegans. Sixty residents here are permanent, and incoming birds are only accepted if we have a fully coached and equipped foster home waiting for them. Our placement policy now requires extensive training as a volunteer, a transition to foster care, and progression to adoption if the fit is a good one. Karen Davis put her finger on what happens in the presence of vast numbers. Our curse on them isn't extinction, but proliferation. In commercial agricultural hells, the numbers and abuses are staggering. CRR's rescues come primarily from birds abandoned by backyard chicken situations. Those numbers also are staggering and increase every year as the fad continues. The quality of life for the hapless birds kept as food in commercial and backyard prisons is a race to the same bottom line, where cheap eggs, meat, and profit becomes a distinction without a difference between them. We had a perception of customary care to overcome. Small barren prens or tractors read small cages that move around with the bird are promoted. As ramshackle coops read boxes constructed from recycled materials read junk that have less space than a battery cage and are lacking in protection from extreme weather and predators. In both realms, the birds are forced to live in their own overcrowded filth and subject to whatever treatment suits their captors. For physical evidence of the tragic suffering of our rescues, um, see our Facebook album, Casualties of Urban Animal Agriculture. We created this poster for posting outside co-ops and city businesses marketing chicks and supplies for backyard chickens. Sustainable backyard farmers grow gardens, not victims. So why are there chickens in need? Again, Chickens are the most abused, exploited, and devalued land animals on the planet, both in unimaginable numbers and degrees of atrocity. We've all seen the pictures. But if that isn't the zenith of bad, someone decided it would be a great idea to promote city people 
who have never cared for an animal to use chickens in their backyards for eggs and meat. And unfortunately, endorsement of the humane hoax comes from organizations like HSUS that claims every family that gets their eggs from backyard hens is likely reducing or eliminating their purchase of eggs laid by hens on factory farms. A difference without a distinction. The fad has created a nationwide epidemic of unwanted chickens, ducks, geese, quail, and other domesticated fowl. They are abandoned at animal sanctuaries and shelters where, when the novelty wears off. Before 2009, we averaged fewer than 40 surrender inquiries a year. Since 2009, when we first began record keeping surrender statistics, we've been asked to help over 3,136 animals, overwhelmingly birds, and in no way have we been able to help them all. We haven't had time to update the graph since 2015. Cities allowing chickens are now too numerous to mention and still growing. Problems coming home to roost is now a common headline, but COVID-induced free time led to first ever sellouts of hatchery chicks. So, where can I find a chicken who needs me? There is no limit to the number of ways chickens can cross your path without ever leaving your neighborhood. They might turn up at a garage sale, in a dumpster, a friend of a friend who got bored, a walk in the park, left somewhere in a box, tossed from a car, or left on the interstate. Many just appear in a backyard and survive off the bird feeder till someone notices them, or maybe being abused in the backyard next door. To find a bird who needs you, you can also contact local animal rights organizations, local humane societies, animal control agencies, and wildlife rehabilitation centers. Ask that they let you know when they take in chickens. Many shelters now use the searchable database PetHarbor.com so you can sign up and receive email notifications about birds at your local shelter. You can also monitor networks like PetFinders.org or other online adoption sites or backyard chicken group forums and Craigslist. They are the mother load for dumping unwanted birds. Please do not incentivize them by purchasing birds. You can also respond to calls for homes after mass rescues organized by established sanctuaries. Two points worth noting with regard to working with animal control agencies. First, often overlooked is the strategic advantage to partnering with a public agency. It legitimizes animal rights politics and advocacy and may lead to your voice influencing public policy and getting media coverage that would otherwise be inaccessible. Chicken Run Rescue declared itself as a stakeholder impacted by chicken politics and worked exhaustively, policies, and worked exhaustively for 16 years with the Minneapolis City Council, regulatory services, and animal care and control to effect chicken permit policies that would protect chickens. The accomplishments we were able to secure were the inclusion of the Minnesota statute definition of companion animal in the city ordinance, which allows the owner to assign companion animal status to chickens. Cruelty to a companion animal is a felony. Cruelty to a food animal is a misdemeanor if it is even charged. We also eliminated a proposed rooster ban from a proposed ordinance. We also eliminated an existing ordinance that prohibited sheltering chickens in a dwelling, vital for tr tropical jungle fowl in an extreme climate like Minnesota. We were able to educate and sensitize some officials and walked away with a letter of commendation from the city council president praising our efforts. But the overwhelming sway was held by the locavores who evangelized the backyard chicken keeping fantasy as a sustainable activity. To our frustration, the city still actively promotes it. Second point about animal control services is pre-COVID animal control agencies used to send officers to catch and impound stray or abandoned chickens. But there are so many now, some shelters don't even bother. So impound shelter data 
does not reflect the number of city birds impacted. In 2001, there were 26 chicken permits in Minneapolis. There are now 366. That's an increase of 1,308%. 1, Plus, the trend in the number of chickens allowed per permit has also increased. Permit compliance rates are about 3%, so there is no good data to represent the actual 97% of households with chickens in most communities. Bottom line is there is a world of birds who need help. A great way to connect with a chicken in need is to volunteer at a vegan sanctuary or rescue near you and offer to foster. You have experience, guidance, material, and emotional support as you learn to love not just a chicken, but this chicken in your arms. Chicken Run Rescue is committed to teach and assist individuals who want to provide a home for rescued birds on a very small scale. This is accomplished by creating a beautiful and inviting home for the birds as a tribute of respect. This home becomes like a pebble in the pond, a place where others around them can see the birds in a different light. Everything we say and do validates the birds as worthy individuals and family members. Chicken Run Rescue turns the tables and sets the standards of care to the highest level we can. We want to showcase what the birds have taught us and hope others will step up, rescue a chicken, and use our ideas and innovations to make a loving home for them. We cannot help them all, but we can help others help them. The first thing to learn is where to turn for care information that is based on what a chicken needs and wants, not on what is cheap, easy, convenient, or what meat or eggs might be taken from them. If you are fostering for a rescue, the rescue should be your first stop for information. Your second stop should be the Open Sanctuary Project's introductory information for compassionate chicken care. Chickens are so universally exploited and devalued, literally anyone with a keyboard will call themselves an expert with impunity. Beware of social media sources like backyard chicken forums or sustainable homestead blogs and the like. They are sources of the most horrendously cruel misinformation sanctioned by animal use and it gets passed on from one novice to the next. Free advice on do-it-yourself vet care is doled out like candy with no accountability. The clueless leading the clueless. Be very cautious of sites that claim veterinary credentials that don't exist. Pay attention to West website suffixes. Dot coms want to sell you something like chicks or supplies. EDUs and dot govs with relation to chicken care will largely be mouthpieces for commercial agriculture focused on production and profit, not the well-being of the birds. And if it relates to rooster health, forget it. For example, one of our roosters, Gomez, has a compromised immune system that is possibly related to testicular cancer. Our vet was recently looking for information on the comparative size of rooster testicles, and he was embarrassed that the best image he could find was at clovegarden.com, an epicurean hedonist site with a recipe for rooster fries. Dot orgs want to persuade you of something, and that's good if it's an experienced vegan sanctuary advocacy organization like opensanctuary.org. The Open Sanctuary Project, they describe, them, they describe themselves this way. The Open Sanctuary Project is freely accessible, always growing digital guide for any resources or information you need in order to responsibly create and successfully manage an animal sanctuary or to provide the best possible care to animals in order to help them live long, healthy, happy lives free of exploitation. While identifying and discouraging practices that are exploitive or harmful to the individual. So, Start your research at opensanctuary.org. It is important to understand chickens' natural history and how they live in the wild and to provide them with an environment that meets those instinctive physical and psychological needs as closely as possible. 
Chickens are all descended from tropical jungle fowl and are adapted to living in a natural habitat that is spacious, richly vegetated, diverse, and warm. This presents a particular challenge in a, in a confined urban setting in a cold climate like Minnesota. Flocks have a highly developed social structure and depend on each other for companionship and security. They can recognize and remember 180 other individual flock members. They are ground dwelling birds. Most are capable of low flight in short distances. Smaller birds can fly higher and farther. In the wild, they roost in trees at dusk before they sleep or to escape predators. They hide their nests and cavities in the ground. The majority of their waking hours are spent active, wide ranging, grazing, foraging for food, plants, bugs, and occasionally small rodents. In their natural state, they typical tra typically travel a uh, half a mile from their roost each day. In the wild, they are never overcrowded. If the population becomes too dense, members will break off into subgroups and spread out. They move on from one area to another, which allows food sources to regenerate and their waste is not concentrated in one place and it can decompose without health, health risk to the flock. Roosters alert the flock to danger find food and call the hens to it and stand guard as they eat. They select and build nests and will even participate in caring for the young. They also act as peacekeepers to intervene in disputes that can develop between flock members. Roosters will start to crow and display courting behaviors at about six months of age. Wild hens spend their time scratching for food, dust bathing, preening, playing, and napping. They begin to lay eggs at about six months of age. Unlike domesticated hens bred to lay one egg a day, hens in the wild produce only a few clutches of eggs a year for the sole purpose of reproduction, and they can live to 30 years old. Chickens are sociable, cheerful, and intelligent creatures who can form lifelong bonds with each other and other species, including humans, dogs, and cats. Because of their keen intelligence and instinctive physical activity, they need a stimulating environment that mimics as much as possible the rich and diverse world nature designed them to enjoy. Once a plan is in place for taking in your first rescue and reliable sources of information have been identified, there are key considerations as you prepare to welcome them. CRR has learned to focus on quality of life, not quantity of rescues. We limit the number of birds who live here because we are committed to each and every bird as an individual. Our first responsibility is to the birds already in our care. Each additional bird taken in diminishes the quality of life for all. It is a mathematical reality of physical space, funds, and the number of hours in a day it takes to give them the quality care each bird deserves. Generally, one to three compatible chickens can be happy and easily well cared for in a typical home environment. Individual birds' sex, age, and temperament can affect compatibility. Overcrowding chickens is the most common mistake. Hens should outnumber roosters. Roosters, single or in pairs, are extremely sociable and can make terrific companions when handled gently and often. Plan to have at least two birds, if compatible, but single birds can thrive with a human or other species friend. Regardless, chickens need the companionship of other living beings. When handling a chicken, pick up and hold as you would a kitten. Never handle by wings, feet, or legs. Herd bird to corner using slow, deliberate movement. Fast action means predator. Slow means no threat. Place hands over the top part of the wings and hold securely, but do not squeeze. Tuck under your arm to keep the wings in place. To restrain for transport or examination, drape the towel over the, sh over the shoulders cape style and wrap it around the body. When transporting, consider travel time and avoid extreme weather conditions. Heat exhaustion can develop quickly. Interior car temps can reach fatal point in 10 minutes. Medium-sized hard pet carriers work well for security, safety, and stress. Line them with a towel. 
Travel treats are a good stress reducer. Offer wet food like greens or cucumber for long trips. Don't travel with water in dishes. Provide water when the vehicle is not moving. If other birds are already present when a new rescue arrives, a 30-day quarantine is recommended to watch for signs of illness and parasites. Avoid no noisy, high traffic areas and allow the bird to acclimate before introducing to other birds, animals, and family. The key concepts behind the living spaces we design for the birds are based on what is physically and psychologically comfortable for them and inviting places for humans or birds to share. Indoors at Chicken Run, we all live under the same roof. We make creative use of a home environment where we can socialize with them year-round, safe and clean, in temperatures comfortable for both the tropical jungle fowl they are and the hairless primates we are. The special needs birds who live in our living room sleep in cupboards and eat breakfast with us. For the able-bodied, we use a combination of large dog crates for sleeping quarters for one or two birds and dog pens with roosts for bonded groups of three or more. New birds learn within 48 hours which space is theirs and head for their room unprompted at bedtime. Indoor dog pens are four by eight by six feet and work great for one to three birds in a spare room, heated sun porch or basement. They are easy to assemble, move, and reconfigure. Tops are covered with golf netting. As many as six compatible birds actually do fine in a pen that size if they have ample access for roaming in the house or outside. Vertical space is as psychologically important as floor space. Floors should not collect and hold moisture and be easy to clean thoroughly so hard surfaces like wood, linoleum, or tile work great. <coughs> Sheet linoleum can be added to protect flooring. A light dusting of sand works nicely as a sweeping compound. CRR uses steam mops which sterilize with no harsh chemicals. Machine washable rugs work well. Walls should be painted or surfaced to withstand regular vacuuming and washing. Roofs made from 2x4s or 2x6s set broadside up are the best for good rest support and foot health spaced. Spaced about 12 inches apart with a, with a rise of 12 inches and the top roof should be 18 inches from the wall for tail space. The addition of a dropping board under the top roof collects droppings and keeps the floor space below clean and habitable. Humans and chickens need the same temperatures for comfort and health. Cohote spent several days under a parked car in sub-zero weather before rescue. Rocky spent the night in sub-zero temperatures and lost his entire decomb to frostbite. Thinking people would never leave their dogs and cats or parrots in a box in the backyard, why would it be appropriate for tropical jungle fowl? Even the Minnesota Department of Agriculture's Guide Poultry Your Way recommends shelters should be kept at a comfortable temperature for the animals with a minimum temperature of 55 degrees Fahrenheit and a maximum temperature of 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Cal and his sister were abandoned in the dead of winter in a park and ride. Cal lost both of his feet. So Skokie and Zelda were left in a wire cage in winter in a backyard in one of the most affluent neighborhoods in the Twin Cities. Skokie lost both feet. Zelda lost both legs. Temperature extremes are the biggest issue in an inhospitable climate like Minnesota. Chickens and humans do not belong in this climate. Living quarters must be heated during the coldest part of the winter and cooled in the hottest part of the summer. Below 32 degrees, we are uncomfortable and cannot maintain body temperature. Below 15 degrees, frostbite begins and hypothermia increases. Between 75 and 85 degrees, panting and dehydration begin. Above 85, heat stress and danger of heat prostration increases. Doors and windows can be open in winter when weather permits. Often they will take one step out and then turn right around and come back in. It's all about accommodating their preferences. 
Portable air filters reduce dust and dander, and HEPA filtered vacuums are used for routine cleaning and air filtration. It cannot be overstated that chickens love windows and crave natural light. It can be supplemented with full spectrum incandescent light to follow normal seasonal light cycles and is important for thorough cleaning and maintenance. During winter months, we also provide portable phototherapy happy lights. It is truly remarkable how the birds will rush to it and park there for hours. Happy lights are an especially vital tool for convalescing birds. Little Lunaris had a condition that took all of her feathers and ravaged her immune system. She was utterly obsessed with light and would seek it out whether it was her happy light or sunspots streaming through the windows. Once diagnosed, we discovered that phototherapy was a standard treatment for the same skin condition in humans. She already knew that. Food and water dishes should be made of non-corrosive material that is easily cleaned. Exclusively, and food and water are fresh daily. Dishes should be hung at about the level of the bird's back. Avoid feeders and waterers, especially galvanized metal, which contains zinc, which is toxic to birds. Large containers are an invitation for stale, spoiled food and stagnant water. Very difficult to clean often and thoroughly and signal a lack of daily care. Wide bottom dog dishes are used for messy treats. A variety of heavy, flat bottom, or differently shaped dishes are used for special feeding of sick or special needs birds or birds with mutilated beaks or excessively large combs. Food containers should be numerous enough to prevent competition or intimidation. Large heavy rubber, rubber feed buckets work nicely to contain messy treats as well. Dishes are washed with soap and water once a week minimum and disinfected. A separate set of dishes marked with Q are used for quarantine birds. Provide one nest box for every three hens. A simple wooden box is provided in the pens, which doubles as a bench. Chickens love benches. Hens crave a cavity with a covered opening for privacy, placed on or as low as to the floor as possible. Shredded paper works well for bedding and nesting material. Indoor activities in winter give them a way to express natural urges and mental stimulation. Large heavy rubber feed buckets filled with play sand or leaves allow for indoor scratching and dust bathing in the winter. Mirrors, sprouted grass, romaine heads, and tree poles are all popular ways for them to pass the time. Outdoors, we create spaces designed and sectioned into various gardens that, make, that provide the same amenities for ever-changing groups of birds who may or may not be compatible. The spaces are well protected from predators, yet respectful of wildlife. Starting with a six-foot perimeter fencing is a must. High, sturdy, durable perimeter fencing is the first line of defense to discourage uninvited human and animal visitors. In a populated environment, a privacy fence is needed. CRR is semi-rural and does not need the privacy, so uses a five by six foot welded wire kennel panels with four by four treated posts and metal anchors. They are fastened with clamps and require only a wrench to reassemble and can be reconfigured in a thousand ways. Can be moved or reconfigured in moments, but are extremely sturdy and beautiful. The perimeter fenced area provides ample space for safe exercise, forage, sunlight, earth, and vegetation that is regularly available to the birds for free time, exploration, and exercise when there is adult supervision. If the supervised area is close to the house with frequent human activity and ample coverage like tree canopy or tall, dense foliage, it is not as critical to be netted, but if it can be feasibly done, it's never a bad idea. A primary interior pen provides secure access to exercise, sunlight, earth, and vegetation to the birds when they are unsupervised, but the caregiver is on the premises at home. 
These interior pens are the second line of defense for the safety and security of the birds. CRR birds are never left outside if there is no one on the premises, and they are vulnerable to theft, vandalism, predators, or other, un other unexpected events. When we are gone, the birds are always brought in the house. The primary pens prevent the birds escape and deter intruders and predators if they should happen to violate the perimeter fencing. CRR uses dog kennel pen kits with golf netting covers exclusively. They are easily assembled and transported, safe, sturdy, can be easily reconfigured and moved as needs change, and beautiful. We discourage building wood and wire fences that take time to build, decay with weather, have jagged aspects that can cause injury, and are pretty much permanent where they are and are farm ugly. Savings in labor and maintenance time easily outweigh differences in initial cost. Partitions or multiple pens are adaptable for birds who are sick, injured, or not getting along. An 8x12 pen provides 24 square feet per bird minimum for four birds. There is no such thing as too much space. The pen should be at least five feet high, enough for you to stand up comfortably for cleaning, maintenance, capture, and also allows for additional roosting. Again, vertical space is as psychologically important as floor space. Choose a well-drained area. Substrate material for the pen should be clean, non-toxic, biodegradable, readily available, inexpensive, and replaceable. Since it will become compacted from little feet and contaminated by concentrated food, droppings, and parasites, it will need to be raked out and replaced regularly. Play sand, leaves, municipal wood chips, sod, and hard wearing ground cover work well. Quick growing annual ryegrass can be sprinkled on mulch to provide forage. Bare dirt is easy to keep clean as long as there is access to vegetation for the birds. If it is mechanically tilled when it gets back to pack down, the dust bathing is divine. A smaller shelter, a small shelter will give the birds a place to avoid wind, rain, and provide a hiding place. This is for daytime use and not intended as living quarters. Chickens are prey animals and crave hiding places. Chicken Run uses an asphalt-based corrugated roofing material to create tunnels to sit on and in. Shade must be available and can be provided by vegetation or strategically placed materials. Camel cloth works beautifully where trees and shrubs are absent. It allows ventilation, shade, natural movement, concealment from predators, and looks beautiful. Taking a dust bath or a sunburn bath is the closest thing to heaven for a chicken. They derive pleasure and contentment by bathing in the sun and in loose, dry soil depressions in the dirt, which cleans their feathers and rids them of parasites. Birds will usually dig their own hole for dust baths. Keep the soil in the dust baths loose and add clay sand if it is a heavy clay soil. CRR has found that diatomaceous earth is not an effective parasite control and it can cause inflammation and scarring to the lungs. There is nothing sadder than a barren pen when compared to the rich jungle environment chickens evolved in. Lots of large branches, stumps, or platforms provide places to go and things to do and look natural and beautiful in the pen. Include bushes, boxes, or other objects to sit in, on, or hide behind. Plastic garden chairs give the birds and humans a place to sit together and share time. Plant kale or other safe edible vegetation around the outside of the pen for forage. Overcrowding, boredom, and barren pens are the most common cause of behavioral problems. Chickens are susceptible to theft, vandalism, and predators. Chicken run rescue birds are snug in the house before dusk, so nocturnal predators have never been a risk, for, but for added security, a 10 kilovolt wire has been added to the top of the perimeter fence and 18 inch concrete pavers added to the outer base. Motion sensor lawn sprinklers and radios are also effective deterrents. 
Security cameras, lights, infrared sensor lights, and alarms, and baby monitors are also commonly used deterrents. Camel cloth also works beautifully to supplement tree canopy and is a hawk deterrent coverage, especially in the spring or late fall when trees are bare. Movement in the breeze is also a deterrent. Chickens know they are vulnerable and are stressed in exposed areas and will always gravitate to cover provided by foliage. Learn what predators live where you are. Fresh food and water are required daily and should be available at all times. Chickens drink one to two cups of water a day. Chicken Run Rescue feeds Rowdy Bush Maintenance Crumble, a top quality nutritionally balanced food specifically formulated for the health of the bird, not for what will be taken from them. Birds free feed and snack all day, about a quarter to a half a cup of crumble per day. That comprises 80% of their diet and the other 20% is fresh foods, especially greens, veggies, and fruits for treats. We offer as little seed as possible, but they do love it. We let them sample everything in the kitchen except onion, coffee, chocolate, mushrooms, and avocado. Bedtime treats are a ritual they all look forward to. Like us, they all have different tastes. Zelda has become a vegan cheeseaholic and barks at me till she gets it. Birds with mutilated beaks require wetter, softer, and smaller food. Eddie follows and whines until she gets her bedtime mush. Roxanne will only take her heart pill in a blueberry. Food that is uneaten or spilled should be cleaned up daily. Manure and wet bedding should be removed daily. At Chicken Run Rescue, crate shredded paper bedding is changed daily. Rugs are laundered weekly. Crates washed and disinfected monthly. Pen roosts are washed daily and disinfected weekly. Pen floors clean swept daily and washed weekly. Deep cleaning of walls and all surfaces are done every spring and every fall. Keeping shelter areas clean and dry will help prevent bacteria, fungi, insects, rodents, etc. Litter is bagged and disposed of as solid waste. If composted, it must be done in an area where the chickens will not scratch for at least a year. Rodent levels will be minimized by keeping all feed in rodent-proof containers and removing spilled or uneaten food promptly. Sanitation for every living is important for every living creature. Chickens enjoy being clean. They love baths. If allowed to choose, no animal will soil where they eat, sleep, or lounge. Chickens hold their night feces until they leave the roost. If they are dirty, it is because their caregiver is not keeping them clean. Two words about chicken diapers. We don't. Chickens dislike having anything attached to their bodies that feels unnatural and restricts their movement and walk backwards to try to rid themselves of it. Our convenience is less important than respect for the bird's dignity and bodily integrity. They need to be changed frequently. When a special health need requires an accessory like a crop bra or an impaction or a frock to compensate for feather loss, we custom make it ourselves from the softest fabric possible and adjust the design till we can see that the bird will tolerate it. Frequent poop patrols with toilet paper and paper towels and washable throws work just fine when they are out and about in the house, especially so if there is only one or two birds. Spray disinfectant or wipes are always at the ready. Chickens are less messy than birds like parrots or doves and smart enough to learn to go where you choose. The social needs of chickens cannot be overstated. Emotional bonds between birds are intense. Chickens are not wired to accept newcomers, so introduction should not be rushed. Should take place in very short but frequent sessions in a neutral but familiar space with plenty of places to avoid each other and close supervision until they are at ease. Temperament, physical limitations, and social structures of animals should be taken into account and separate areas and accommodations provided for incompatible birds. Human to human bird bonds, human to bird bonds are life-changing. 
Allow the birds to make as many choices as possible. Let them move at their own pace. Never rush them. Learn to communicate and suggest with soft voice and body language, never with force or inflict. Cats and chickens are quite compatible, except for very tiny birds or chicks. Supervision is always a must until behavior is routine. CRR is home to two formerly feral cats who live cheek by jowl with the birds and everyone is at ease. Do keep chickens away from the litter box if clumpable litter is used. Non-clumping compressed pine works great. Dogs and birds can be wonderful companions. Basic dog behavior training techniques work wonders with both. Time, patience, and intelligent supervision will let your dog get used to a bird and vice versa until their behavior is routine. Audio and visual desensitization with a safe barrier is key. Once everyone understands everybody belongs there, they all accept it and move on. If only humans worked like that. One of CRR's primary missions has been to improve access to the same quality of vet care available to conventional companion animals. A vet experience with companion animals, companion birds is worth their weight in gold. CRR was the first to publish a list of 18 clinics in our vicinity that treat chickens and is currently conducting a survey of 123 clinics who treat chickens within a 250 mile radius. When choosing a vet, investigate to determine how knowledgeable and experienced they are before you need one. Schedule a well bird exam once you identify a candidate. If ABVP, avian practice, appears after their name, this indicates board certification examination to show com competency in avian medicine. Vets who specialize in exotics may also have a broader and more innovative approaches to bird medicine. An industry poultry or farm vet's purpose is ensuring the economic health and comfort of the owner, not the health and comfort of the individual bird. Diagnosis and treatment favors culling and killing, not curing. A good vet should call the bird by name be willing to sit on the floor and talk to them and collaborate with, not dictate to you. Birds should be held and examined every day. CRR prevents, treats preventatively for internal and exterior, external parasites every spring and fall. Keep daily notes on a phone calendar of feather condition, eggs, contraceptive implants, meds, weights, behavior or symptoms out of the ordinary. Watch for change in the usual activity, unusual posture, closed eyes, discharge, head tucked, poor appetite, unusual poop, coughing, or sneezing. Upper respiratory infections, crop impactions, and reproductive complications are common and serious conditions. Schedule vet appointments if there are specific concerns. Carrier and birds should be clean. Annual exams and fecals are recommended, but if there are health conditions that require monitoring, more regular visits might be needed. Have an isolation crate and a heating pad at the ready for sick or injured birds. Critical emergency first aid supplies should be kept, including roll gauze, gauze pads, tape, vet wrap, blood stop powder, antibiotic ointment, antibacterial scrub, and a solution and solution and bandage scissors. Many urban activists shy away from farm animal advocacy due to lack of confidence that comes from first-hand knowledge. Truly knowing an animal comes from loving them for who they are, not for what they can be taken from them. This knowledge can give us courage in our convictions and make us more effective in educating those around us. To that end, we have launched an Instagram campaign where fosters can share what they have learned from their chickens. Whether it's in a battery cage, an enriched cage, or a backyard, constant laying kills hens. There's nothing benign or natural about it. There is no such thing as a vegan egg. There is a bird who suffers for it. 
a bird who had a history and an interest in living. How do we keep the animal from getting lost when we talk about being vegan? One way is to remember they are the whole unalienable point to being vegan. Another way is to literally embrace them with a beating heart, eye to eye, with a squirm, a buck buck, and a burble, and the warmth of prehistoric toes grasped around a finger, like learning a new language. Thank you.